brother, Dr. Walter M. Kimbrough, who is our keynote speaker. He is a native of Atlanta, Georgia, where he was a high school salutatorian in 1985. He's earned degrees from the University of Georgia, Miami University in Ohio, and a doctorate in higher education from Georgia State University. He has had an, an, a great career. Matter of fact, he has a lifetime of high achievement and it yet is a very young man. Dr. Kimbrough has been recognized for his research and writings on historically black colleges and universities and African American in the African American colleges. Dr. Kimbrough has been noted for his active use of social media, engaging students in articles by the Chronicle of Higher Education, Case Currents, and Arkansas Life. He was cited in 2010 with a by bachelorsdegree.com as one of the 25 college presidents that you should follow follow on Twitter. And for those of you that use social media, if you want to know how to reach him, he's at Hip Hop Prez. He's a 1986 initiate of Zeta Pi chapter of Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity at the University of Georgia. Dr. Kimbrough um, was college Alpha Alpha Phi Alpha college brother of the year in the Southern region and served as Region Assistant Vice President. He's forged a national reputation as an expert in fraternities and sororities, with specific expertise regarding historically black, Latin, and Asian groups. He's the author of the book, Black Greek 101, The Culture, Customs, and Challenges of Black Fraternities and Sororities. So Dr. Kimbrough was also named the 1994 New Professional of the Year for the Association of Fraternity Advisors and selected as a 2001 Nissan ETS HBCU Fellow. In 2009, he was named by Diverse Issues in Higher Education as one of the 25 to watch. Dr. Kimbrough has also been recognized by Ebony Magazine as on the Power 100 list of doers and influencers in the African American community, joining the likes of President and Ms. Mrs. Obama, Jay-Z, Richard Par Parsons, Tyler Perry, Deborah Lee, and Tom Joyner. And finally, in February 2013, he was named the, N the NBC News and Grio.com's 100 African Americans Making History Today. Joining other impressive members of the group, including Kerry Washington, Ambassador Susan Rice, Kendrick Lamar, Melody Hobson, and RG3. Now, Dr. Kimbrough now currently serves as the 12th president, excuse me, as the 7th president of Dillard University in New Orleans, Louisiana. It is, <laughs> welcome from the brothers from Dillard University. It is my pleasure and my honor, and I'd ask you all to stand to your feet and welcome brother, Dr. Walter M. Kimbrough to our stage. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, brother, for that introduction. To President Johnson, Brother Moore, who extended the invitation, the officers of Zy Kappa Lambda chapter, brothers and guests. I am pleased to be here today to speak on this 25th annual Founders Day breakfast. Founders Day is an important time for the members of this organization to reflect on those who establish this fraternity and recommit to the ideas and values of the fraternity. Now when a chapter plans a Founders Day, the one selected to speak is always of key concern. It is considered a coup to be able to land the sitting general president of the fraternity. Brother Ward has given numerous addresses such as this one. The next would be a former general president and then a current or past regional vice president or highly sought speakers. In other cases, chapters look for brothers of great renown in various fields. Sadly today, you have a college president as your speaker. <laughs> college presidents are awful speakers most of the time. Taught to avoid controversy and missteps, they normally write a speech word for word, closely reading every word as I am today, <laughs> making sure that they don't offend anyone or say anything that might bristle the listener. 
I hope that you will continue to view college presidents as the leaders they are. But in this age of Trump, we don't have time for timid, feckless, mealy-mouthed presidents afraid to use their willy pulpit to address the serious issues of the day. Amen. So buckle up. <laughs> now I'm scared for a minute there. I, I really do. I hate hearing college presidents. They're boring. So anyway, for a few minutes this morning, I want you to reflect with me on this topic. The quantity, quality, quandary. Revisiting the Talented Ten. The quantity, quality, quandary. Revisiting the Talented Ten. As I prepare for today, I went into my file of, I have a big file of alpha related stuff. As you heard, I've been an assistant vice president, college brother of the year for the Southern region. Um, so I've been active in the fraternity since my initiation in 1986. And so I went and I found my application to the fraternity. And in 1986, Zeta Pi, they had you, they gave you the application, you had to type it out. We had to put it on golden rod paper. You added your resume, you got it in this black bind, and you turned it all in. We had to do all of that as a part of it. And I'm reading why I was interested in being a part of this organization. And then I can think about attending that smoker when we call them smokers. And I was at the smoker and the speaker for our smoke, smoker was Brother John Townsend um, from Columbus, Georgia, very active in Athens. And as a part of Brother Townsend, he's got you all excited. And I'm a freshman, okay? I just, I'm in my second quarter at Georgia. I'm a freshman. And I'm sitting here, I'm excited, I'm listening to him, and then he gives us this sort of magical ride through the state of Georgia. And as we go in this car ride, he's telling us about all of these great alpha men who made an impact, not only locally, but then nationally. He brings on, I mean, we stop at the, in the car and in in this, this mind, this conversation we're having, and we look at the traffic signal. He would link that to Brother Morgan in terms of creating a traffic signal and a gas mask and all that. And we're going through Atlanta and talking about Andrew Young and Martin Luther King, and we link all this together, so I'm excited. And so then he talks about that in Alpha Phi Alpha, we're not looking for quantity. We're looking for quality. And so then he ends his speech and he says, look, all great men are not alpha men, but all alphas are great men. And so then he said, all the great men, please stand up. So I'm a freshman, so I'm like, I'm about to stand up too, because I'm feeling great right now. And I was like, <laughs> I think he's talking to them, you better sit down. <laughs> so I, was, I was like, I was feeling it. I was excited to be a part of that. But that is a concept that we've continued to hear over and over in this fraternity. If you go to your history book, chapter three, Brother Wesley writes, the founders saw Alpha as an organization of unusual merit and unique character among Negro college students. Brother James Major at Wilberforce University in 1920, when I was doing research for my book, wrote these words. It is not quantity that we seek, but quality, in order that we may progress and be counted among the chapters which have for their aim high and lofty ideas, who realize that Alpha Phi Alpha is not for college, but for life. George Biddle Kelly in 1936 wrote, our main purpose in 1906 was to found a fraternity composed of groups of undergraduates so chosen in the various colleges and universities that they would represent the best, the best of the Negro youth at that institution. And finally, just in looking at today's climate, Brother Cornell West in a book called The Future of the Race writes, there has not been a time in history of black people in this country when the quantity of politicians and intellectuals was so great, yet the quality of both groups has been so low. The reality remains is that you often do need the numbers to make the change. And so we're in this quandary. If we think about the recent midterm elections, People in this state were really excited about Beto. He was all over the place. National meeting of following. 
but he didn't still have enough people vote for him to unsee Cruz. In my home state of Georgia, Stacey Abrams ran a great campaign, Spelman College graduate. People got excited, but I was just going through my phone and looking at some of the news reports. There's a new article in the Atlanta Journal-Constitution that indicated that even in that race, young people, people younger than 34, only a, they only comprised one-fifth of the total electorate, which was down from 2016. The older folks, particularly rural folks, came out to keep Kemp in office, the man who's suppressing the vote, and young people still didn't come out to vote. So here we are with this quandary. Simply having a few high-quality people is often not enough. One of my favorite movies, I don't know how many people have seen the movie, The 300, it's one of my favorite movies. Every time it comes on, I watch it. And so, you know, this whole idea is that, you know, the Persians are about to take over Greece, and they come to Sparta, and they're like, look, you know, Xerxes, the guy king, will, will give you all these things if you will bow down, and King Leonidas is not having all of that. So he kicks the herald and the messengers and down the well, and they're going to take on the 300,000 Persian army. And he's going with 300 people. 300 against 300,000. And so they have some successes along the way. He has a strategy, but he gets betrayed along the way. And in the end, they're going to die. He knows it, so he tells them the night before, he's like, prepare for glory, because he knows we're going to die, but he's creating this narrative. And as great as that army was, the 300, they couldn't defeat 300,000. So sometimes you do need the numbers. But then again, sometimes just having a lot of people doesn't move the needle either. As a part of that same movie, there was a group of, of Greeks called the Arcadians, and they were just brawlers. They just out there swinging and just wild. They could do some damage, but that wasn't a long-term strategy to change anything. They're just out there swinging and flailing and doing all kinds of things. So we put this in a broader perspective. 70 years ago, Brother W.E.B. Du Bois gave the Talented 10th Memorial Address at the 19th Sigma Pi Phi Boule Convention. It was the 45th anniversary of the Talented 10th. And when Du Bois came up with the idea of the Talented 10th, he talked about what he called the Negro problem, that blacks were being lynched and mobbed, disenfranchised, segregated from main areas of life. And so in that speech he said, I looked upon them and saw salvation through intelligent leadership, through a talented tent. So Du Bois saw himself as saying, how am I going to address this quality, quantity, quandary through a talented tent, the concept now that he developed in 1903, 115 years ago. So we're at the 115th anniversary of the talented tent the 70th anniversary, um, 115th anniversary of the town of 10th and the 7th anniversary of his memorial address. So for a few minutes, let's think about the quantity of leadership that, that we need and the quality of leadership that we need and where we get it. Okay? Y'all okay with that? All right. Point number one. What kind of leaders do we need? We need leaders with a disciplined mind. We're in an age today where the smallest thing takes us off the rails and we just, we lose everything. And some of this is social media based. I wake up every morning, I'm listening to MSNBC and most of their coverage is, what did Trump tweet this morning? Because that dude messes up every day. I'm so, I mean, had not former President Bush died last night, he would have said something crazy already by the day. And we'd be talking about that for the rest of the day. So we get caught up and we still, and then we start focusing on things that don't matter. People want to know, well, what has Kanye done lately? And what did Kanye say in the Oval Office? And in the new Jay-Z song, is he really taking shots at Kanye? And then what did Kanye's wife do? And so we get caught up in all those kinds of things and we want to know that. Or once again, so how many people are active on social media? Okay, a lot of y'all social media. It's like last week, I guess it was, you know, social, and particularly on Twitter, you see on the timeline, you see different things trending, and you want to know what's going on. And sometimes when you see a famous person trending, sometimes you worry something bad happened to them, and you're concerned. So it's like last week, I saw Jill Scott was trending. <laughs> and I was like, oh, what happened to Jill Scott? 
So then I looked, and then they were like, Jill Scott got some video. And I'm like, video? And then I saw the video of Jill Scott. <laughs> That's all I need to say. <laughs> and so you like messed up for the day, because I'm like, Jill Scott. <laughs> she didn't do that when I went to Essence a couple years ago. Why did I miss that performance? It was just, you know. So we just get that, but it, so we get caught up in these little things that happen all the time. And then we start missing, I was having a conversation with Brother Jenkins earlier today, we start missing some long-term things that are happening. That are very nefarious and we're sleeping on all those things. We're not really paying attention to what's happening with this interim attorney general. We've got a lot of stuff going on and they really not rushing to get a permanent attorney general. So I got to think about what is going on with that. We're not having complex conversations, particularly those of us who are supportive or people who are supportive of the president understanding that how can a car company that you're promised that they're going to bring open more and more plants announce they're going to lose 14,000 jobs. Well, people got caught up in Wisconsin and hearing about this company called Foxconn that helps make iPhones, that they're going to come and, and, and build all kinds of plants. When if you read a book by Alec Ross called The Future of Work, he talks about the founder of Foxconn in China says he doesn't want to hire people anyway. He wants to have everything be automated. He'd rather have robots. And so those people in Wisconsin who came up with this great tax incentive for Foxconn, they're paying for a plant they will never get because that's not what Terry Gu, who was over this company, ever does. They get caught, so they don't even pay attention to those things. Or there was a story in Brookings that talked about wealth inequality in this country, and they calculated that racism is costing black folks an average of $48,000 based on homeowner wealth because they looked at houses in similar situations. They, they equated everything else, but one neighborhood is mostly black and one neighborhood is mostly white, and those houses in black neighborhoods were worth $48,000 less. And most of our wealth accumulation as a people comes from home ownership. Those are the things we're not talking about. In an article called Anti-Intellectualism is Killing America, David Neos in Psychology Today 2015 wrote, America is killing itself through its embrace of the exaltation of ignorance and the evidence is all around us. In a country where the, ch the chairman of the Senate Environmental Panel brought a snowball into the chamber as evidence that climate change is a hoax, where almost one in three citizens can't name the vice president, it is beyond dispute that critical thinking has been abandoned as a cultural value. Our failure as a society to connect the dots, to see that such anti-intellectualism comes with a huge price, could eventually be our downfall. This was written in 2015. Guess who was elected in 2016? The epitome of anti-intellectualism. It also shows that the group that consistently supports the president today in every poll are the uneducated white rural voters. So they go to rallies and they like them. And I, I watch a lot of the rallies. It's like it's a combination of Pentecostal service, WWE wrestling, and a Klan rally all wrapped in one. <laughs> It's entertaining now. It's I mean, he's good. He's, I mean, he's a good entertainer. When you wrap all that together, that's what you have. And so he's chanting, build a wall, lock her up, and no collusion. You're going to get a tax cut and all these things. Here, here's the harsh part of the day. You're going to have to hold on to this because I, I, we, if we're going to talk about the leadership that we need to move forward, we're going to have to address an issue within this organization. Alpha Phi Alpha now is anti intellectual I made a presentation to the Board of Directors in January of 2010. We're talking about membership intake. I spoke at four of the five regional conventions that year. And on this task force for membership intake, Brother Rodney Cohen, who went to Clark College, I've known Rodney since the 80s, he made a statement that, that made me sit up. He said, we don't really call ourselves the men of distinction anymore. Then I did a Google search, Alpha Phi Alpha, Men of Distinction, and then Alpha Phi Alpha and Ape. Three times as many Ape references as Men of Distinction. 
In the 2010 Alpha Protocol, the Etiquette Manual, Section 4.10 on banned behavior says, one, public display of the eight eight like behavior is prohibited. Two, in the past, chapters and brothers have misused the ape symbol publicly to represent Alpha Phi Alpha. Three, brothers and chapters are prohibited from using the ape publicly to represent Alpha Phi Alpha. Four, the ape is not to be placed on official Alpha Phi Alpha paraphernalia. Brothers are not to act like apes in step shows and other public programs, and ape calls are prohibited. I like to say we become the cues, who in 1983 created a policy on the canine reference that they haven't been able to run through because we still call them the cue dogs and they embrace that. And so when you have this kind of idea, we start running out of insurers then that want to be associated with the group, with the ape imagery, and not the men of distinction. You pay attention when you go to conventions. See when you see the paraphernalia, people walking around with men of distinction. Because I ain't seen it. But I see apes everywhere. So we've got to correct our anti-intellectualism. That's point one. Y'all okay? I told y'all, it's like, I'm just going to say what I got to say. I'm going home after this. I'm, I got to just, we got to say this. We're going to really deal with this. Point two, we've got to have courageous minds. Disciplined minds and courageous minds. In Du Bois' commencement address at Howard University in 1939, he said, to increase abiding satisfaction for the mass of our people and for all people, someone must sacrifice something of his own happiness. This is the duty only to those who recognize it is a duty. It is silly to tell intelligent human beings to be good and you will be happy. The truth is today you will be good, be decent, be honorable, and self-sacrificing, and you will not always be happy. You will often be desperately unhappy. You may even be crucified, dead, and buried, and on the third day you will be just as dead as the first. <laughs> but with the death of your happiness may easily come increased happiness and satisfaction and fulfillment for other people. Strangers, unborn babes, uncreated worlds. One of the things I think that we have to do as an organization is be able to lead and address people who are different from us that people are afraid to associate with and connect with. Sometimes we get caught up that this person, um, Lawrence Otis Graham wrote a book called Our Kind of People. We don't associate with certain people. We don't really deal with those people and we get caught up that we can't have those kind of relationships. And we've got to be courageous to say, I'm going to speak for those people even if sometimes they might have some issues or not, might not want me to because it's bigger for the broader uh, community. I had to learn that, and I think about it around this time of year, every year, around Thanksgiving time, because I, this is something that my mom had to teach me. My father's United Methodist minister. My mom started in corporate America. She taught religion at Clark Atlanta University. And she started a tradition that we have in my family now. At Dillard, I have students who can't go home for Thanksgiving and Christmas because they're too far away. So they know they can only go home at the end of the semester. So they need a place to eat for Thanksgiving. So we let them come to our house. We've been doing it at, now 10 years straight. We did that philander, and then we've continued that tradition. There was a student who was a freshman at philander. Her name is Carmela. Um, she came to our house for Thanksgiving her freshman year, and she has been with us every year for Thanksgiving. She got her master's, she was in Florida. I was real mad the year, she was like, okay, I'm coming for Thanksgiving, you gonna buy my ticket? <laughs> uh, I'm glad she got a job now, she can buy her own ticket. <laughs> then a couple years ago, she was like, yeah, I'm just gonna be with y'all every year for Thanksgiving. It's just like, this is what I do, every year I'm here for Thanksgiving. And then when I get married, me and my husband come, I was like, wait, wait, wait. wait. <laughs> and I ain't signed on for all that. But so part of it is that's sort of what I saw my mom do because Clark Atlanta also has students come from all across the country. So I would, you know, come home. I'm at the University of Georgia in Athens. We'll come home for Thanksgiving. Um, and one year she said, yeah, I got some students coming. Not a big deal. She said, and you know, one of my students who's coming over, you know, she needs a place to eat. Uh, she has a job. I just want to let you know she has a job. She's an Adesius. And, um, you know, I want her to have this experience with our family. And I'm just like, oh, I don't know about that. And I don't know if you need to have the Agdesis come to our house and have dinner with us. And she was like, look, why well, ain't you trying to listen? Y'all know what Agdesis is, anybody? Let me, let me help y'all understand. Um, y'all been to the ballet before? Everybody know the ballet? So think of this as the urban ballet. 
You know, so like at the ballet, you know, the dancers wear tutus and everything. And at the urban ballet, the dancers are fabric free. <laughs> you know, like at the ballet, they're playing Tchaikovsky and people like that. And at the urban ballet, they're playing, you know, Lil John and Lil Wayne. Y'all know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Some of y'all just like, yeah, I was at the urban ballet last night. <laughs> That's what it's called, adhesis. Okay, all right, I learned a new word. But my mom was like, no, this is, and so it's like, and I'm thinking my mom is her religion teacher. For her to be able to tell her religion teacher that that's what she did was powerful, that they had that kind of relationship, that she could do that. How are we making ourselves available for people that despite whatever they do that the society might look down on, they're willing to open up to us, to be in relationship with us? Or do we present ourselves as we are Alpha Phi Alpha and you can't come next to us? Are we making ourselves available as a part of our leadership? Are we courageous enough to make ourselves open and available for everyone? That's got to be a part of our mission as a fraternity. I remember when Cornell West was having a conversation on the Tavis Smiley panel and talking to Jesse Jackson, and he was saying this thing that, you know, it, he says, if you decide that you're going to speak on behalf of a people that often hate themselves, there is a depth of commitment that is required. There is a cost that be, will be wrought from you. If you don't love these people they will often, that often hate themselves, he says you need to get off the stage and go home and make a career for yourself and talk about your accomplishments. Because we need people in the struggle. We need courageous leaders. Finally, we need people with an action-oriented mind. So disciplined mind, courageous mind, and now action-oriented mind. After the 2016 election, rapper David Banner went on Facebook and sort of went on this sort of 15 minute sort of reflection. It wasn't a rant, it was a reflection. And one of the things that he said that stuck me, he said, this election might be the best thing ever to happen to black people in history because now there is no excuse. He's like, look, y'all know what the deal is now. That means we got to do better. He said, I know I got to do better. I need to read more. I need to get out in the community more. He's saying we've got to encourage ourselves to do more. And so one of the things that we have to think about is in moving our cultures from being protests for publicity, which a lot of people do when, you know, somebody's protesting somewhere, they're taking pictures of themselves, they're putting it on Facebook and Instagram, and then that's all they've done. I was there. And so I was laughing. Uh, James Foreman Jr., who is a professor at Yale, spoke on my campus this week. Um, he just wrote a book called Locking Up Our Own. It talks about this complex intersection of black people who are in key positions in cities, mayors and prosecutors, and how they're locking up lots of black folks. So it's a challenge. And his father was very involved in SNCC and the civil rights movement. And his father would always tell him to say, you've just got all these people who you know, said they were at the march in Washington. They did all these things, but they weren't there. They say, in those days now, I'm becoming more and more a number now. When I hear people who say, I was there with Dr. King, I'm like, Right, because it's not that many folks left who are really there with Dr. King, okay? In the next 10, 15 years, when somebody say that to me, I'm just gonna be like, you lying, go sit down somewhere, okay? It's, but he said people over-exaggerated that anyway. And so, but we've seen this particularly in the last five years because there were these seminal events that happened in black America that generated a lot of interest for people. The death of Trayvon Martin, Mike Brown, and Jordan Davis. So they had a lot of talking about that, but then a lot of things didn't happen. I'm really interested, though, when you see people like Lucy McBath, who was Jordan Davis's mom, who ran for office in Georgia this past year, and she won a seat in Congress. And the real tripped out thing about it is that she won the seat that was once held by Newt Gingrich. Black woman who holds Newt Gingrich seat? That's impressive. But it wasn't just my son was shot and killed and we got all this stuff in the stay your ground. She's like, no, I'm about to do something about this. I'm about to go to work. I'm about to go to Congress and help change these laws that cost my son his life. And the man is hardly being held accountable for those kinds of things. That's the kind of action. And so there are lessons that we can learn that, yeah, we can protest and be upset about those kinds of things, but there are significant things that we could do right now. Easy things we could do. I, I've had conversations in the city of New Orleans. I was at a business council meeting, and one of the convention and business bureau leaders said that, um, you know, a lot of people 
don't get jobs. And there were plenty of jobs, he said. We got jobs with people. But people are not getting jobs because they come and they are not properly dressed. They don't have good interview skills or they fail drug tests. What if, what if our organizations all over the country had a place that if people were looking for that first job, we could make sure that they were properly clothed, that we could do some practice interviews for them, and make sure they could stay clean? What if we could do those kinds of things? Or what if we, and this is something that as an organization that's focused on education a lot, how do we address what I see as an impending crisis is about to happen in terms of students being able to go to college and there's this push and pull between student loan debt and what colleges and universities charge and I was in Atlanta earlier this week and the Secretary of Education DeVos just talked about we're going to really start dealing with this student loan crisis and, and so what's going to really happen with this is that they're going to keep raising the standards for people to be able to get a loan. Well who does that impact? That impacts people who don't have the kind of credit to get a loan in the first place. You know, it's basically like they're saying, you gotta have money to get money. Well, if I had money, I wouldn't have to get money. But that's what they're, that's coming. I just see it every time they talk about this loan crisis, people taking out too much money, so then you're gonna tell people who don't have any resources that you can't qualify to get a loan because we don't want you to go in debt. So it's like, what are they supposed to do? So what kind of creative programs are we going to create to help address that for young people? And I'm at a place at Dillard, 75% of our students are Pell Grant eligible, which means they come from families that earn less than $40,000 a year. Very bright people. A third of my students come with no expected financial family contribution based on the government. It says your family isn't expected to contribute anything because y'all ain't got it. What happens to those folks if they can't get some of the loan programs that this is, this is coming. I'm waiting to see what they propose in the government, but it's going to be something that changes. They've already changed something. They got rid of the Perkins Loan Program. They changed the Parent Plus Loan Program to raise the bar. They're going to keep raising the bar. It's going to wipe out a class of people. And most of those people will look like the people sitting in this room. So what are we going to do about it? Are we just going to sit back and just wait and just say, oh, well, it's too bad? Or are we going to really come up with some creative programs to address these kinds of issues. These are the kinds of things that Dr. King talked about at our anniversary convention in Buffalo in 1956. He says there is a cost to do this kind of work and we have to take responsibility personally for some of that cost. King said in order to gain this freedom and to move away from the cycles of segregation, we have got to go down in our pockets and give some money. We cannot use the excuse anymore that we don't have the money. This is 1956, okay? He said, we, we can't use that excuse. We have it for everything else that we want. We have the biggest and the finest cars in the world and we can spend it for all those frivolities. Now let us use money for something lasting, not merely for extravagances. There is much work that can be done and we've got to make some sacrifices for the good of the people. Well, in that 1948 speech by Du Bois, he called for a new talented tent. He described it as group leadership, not simply educated and self-sacrificing, but with clear vision of present world conditions and dangers. And then he starts to wrestle some more with the quandary that I spoke of. He's talking to the members of the Boulay Sigma Pi Phi. And in the speech he says, what can Sigma Pi Phi do to see that we get it for the American Negro? So far as the group before me is concerned, little can be done for the simple reason that most of our present membership will soon be dead. Unless we begin to recruit this fraternity membership with young men and large numbers of them, our biennial conclave will be increasingly devoted to obituaries. His idea was, that the Boule would have a membership that equal to one out of every 100 black families in the country. After first thinking it would be a 10. He said, what if we could just get one of our members equals one of 100 black families in the country? Or as he said, a body large enough to really represent all yet small enough to ensure exceptional quality. He said, this is my re-examined and restated theory of the Talented Tenth, which has become the doctrine of the guiding hundred. 
He said, I can't get a 10. I thought I was going to be able to get it. I thought college students would be able to do it. That's not going to happen. If I could get 100, small enough where they could really help guide and do those kinds of things. And if we take that idea, we would know that Alpha alone is not enough to provide that one out of every 100. The fact is, we barely have a talented tenth in the fraternity. A recent study of 25 years of initiatives found that only 14% of us are active. So this is the quandary we must address. We need a critical mass of quality leaders who are disciplined and courageous and action-oriented that will lead the masses to a new future. So where do we find them? I go back to the movie, The 300, but the sequel to the movie called The Rise of an Empire. So in this sequel, Xerxes, the Persian god king, has declared war on Greece. There's a new Greek general, Demosthenes of Athens, and he convinces the council to let him fight. Now remember, Leonidas had 300 against the 300,000. Demosthenes wants to fight as well, and they're doing, they're successful. The, the Greeks are great fighters, strategic and that kind of thing, but he realizes there's still too many, so he goes back to Sparta to ask, um, a Leonidas' wife, Queen Gorgo, to just unite all of Greece. We gotta unite everybody and come together to defeat the Persians. And by the end of the movie, she is convinced that you see the, the entire fleet, all the Greeks come together to fight this common enemy. I would argue that the numbers that we need for the fight that we have in this country, we already have. We have the initiated men in this fraternity to make the change in this country right now. And yet folks are stray for different reasons. Life happens, we get busy, families, job, those kinds of things that happen. But we've got to convince people that they are a part of a broader movement. They got to have those situations where they can go back and think, what was that mindset as I was when I was 18 years old, sitting and listening to John W. Townsend about why I wanted to be in this organization? And to look at what I wrote as an 18-year-old and say, why do I want to be in this organization and have those things change? And what are the needs of our people today? And what is my responsibility to help address that? We've got the membership to make a dent to have the quality people that we need, but we've got to go out. Basically, we need brothers to have a Themistocles type spirit. Well, we're going out and recruiting people. He went to the queen to say, we've got to have more people. We've got to pull together everybody from all the major cities in Greece. We've got to come together to deal with this common enemy. So it, it might not be a town of 10 or a guiding 100. I don't know how many people constitute a critical mass. But I think we've got to be like the Mastocles and bringing brothers back into the fold as well as, as, well as initiating high quality men for the fight in front of us. Because we do have a fight. You don't recognize the fight. Let me give you some of the names of those we are fighting with. It's called racism, and poverty, and ignorance. It's called wealth inequality, and misogyny, and fatherlessness. It's called the criminal legal system, something I learned from Forme. He said he didn't call it the criminal justice system because there's no justice in it. It's the criminal legal system. It's white nationalism and white supremacy. We've got to wrestle with this. So to solve this quandary, we have to start with the quality brothers that we have. Reach out, find those other quality brothers who have strayed, but that can build up our quantity, and then we can address the issues of the day. It is imperative that we solve the quality, quantity, quandary. Thank you.